Welcome to Detangle, where we untangle the complexities of life one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Kinjal Goel, a psychologist and a writer. We have with us today Dr. Sonal Parmar, the principal of the Cathedral and John Collins School, Mumbai. Dr. Parmar has taught English at the undergraduate level in Delhi University Colleges and worked with various organizations and NGOs. She has also worked in different roles in the areas of translation, editing, and writing for nearly seven years. Born and brought up in Allahabad, Dr. Parmar came to Delhi for her higher education and then moved to Mumbai six years ago, taking on the role of the principal of one of India's leading schools. A literature buff, she finds herself happiest in the company of the written word. It's time to chat with Dr. Parmar and discover the person behind that beautifully imposing desk. Welcome to Detangle, ma'am, and thank you so much for taking the time and being with me today. Good morning, Dr. Goel. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of your podcast. Ma'am, at the helm of one of India's leading schools, everyone knows you as the principal of Cathedral and John Connell. But take us back in time. How and when did your career in education start? I think I've reached where I have. These of coincidences or uh, uh, kind of the universe has conspired in some way because if you had told me 15 years back, Dr. Cole, that I would ever be in a school, mm-hmm. forget as a principal, but in any capacity, most probably I would have been very dismissive and amused. And I think that's life having a laugh at me now. But um, I started off when I was doing my MA, I started teaching at the undergraduate level in uh, Delhi University Colleges and was there for a couple of years. But I somehow felt that, you know, this is nice, but this is uh, maybe not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So it was more a process of elimination rather than anything else. And I started freelancing. So I worked as an independent translator and uh, editor and, uh, you know, content writer for a couple of different organizations. I was very, very lucky because I got good work, Uh, worked with institutions like the Raza Foundation or uh, the India Habitat Centers, Visual Art Gallery, um, IGNCA also at some point, uh, Film Directorate of India. So uh, very involved in culture or very interested in culture, I should say. And therefore, it was work that I enjoyed. And you don't have a boss. You choose what you want to do. So there are a lot of, um, I mean, it was good. I think I was quite happy. Hmm. In the meantime, one of the jobs that I took up was as editor-in-chief of the English publications, essentially around their uh, international theatre festival at the National School of Drama where I continued as editor-in-chief for eight years. And uh, that was an entirely different, you know, uh, experience for me. I loved it. And then a very good friend of mine who happened to be an advisor in one of the schools in Noida uh, told me that, look, we're looking for a teacher for English uh, for the IB, and can you help out? And I still remember that I told her, of course not. I mean, I, I have no experience with children, and I don't have kids of my own. So I actually had no experience with children of that age group and I had never, ever been in a school uh, professionally. So I completely rejected, but she was very insistent and she said, you know, just just come teach and leave. So I uh, the school got my IB and IGCSE training done. And I started teaching and I was exactly that a very, very reluctant first timer. I would go to school, teach and come out. And um, somewhere in one of those many, many, (laughs) uh, one one of those many days, I think I just realized that, hey, I really like doing this. And I like talking to the kids of this age group. I I think I get along with them. I think we can, we connect well. I love teaching at this level. So that's what happened from a part-timer. I became a full-timer. And then uh, started, you know, leading the English department with my colleagues, uh, took over the career counseling department. Uh, I love my subject. So it was actually just a joy to be teaching. And I loved my students 
who I think are the biggest reason for me deciding that I want to do this. And one day I got a call from Mrs. Isaacs, the principal of the cathedral school, offering me um, the position of a vice principal in cathedral. And I was very, very taken aback because mm. uh, I had zero experience in administration. And I still recall I told her that, ma'am, I think you've made a mistake because I have no experience in uh, in administration, but she said that she knew exactly what she was talking about. And I came to Bombay for an interview with the board and uh, well, uh, they made me an offer and I moved to Bombay and joined the school in 2018 as vice principal. And uh, two years back in 2022, I took over as principal. So that, as you can see, is a journey that has been all over the place. But I think uh, that the, the eclectic nature of my experiences has really uh, made life very interesting. And I think I'm the richer for it. Ma'am, it's so beautiful that you have brought in so much diversity to the central role. We are but a collection of our experiences. And to start with so much behind you, it is so nice that, you know, all of this has come together in a role which now leads so many children. So more power to you on that. You know, one of the things, ma'am, that has always struck me unique about uh, Cathedral is the presence of different counsellors for different age groups of students. Mm. This shows the school's tremendous commitment to mental health. But tell me, how does the system work? Uh, all right. So I think that, uh, you know, the school has been very forward. Mm -hmm. And um, today when I, based on uh, where I am now, I think mental health, Dr. Goel, you would know, is emerging is such a huge challenge across ages and uh, especially amongst our kids. I think they are really struggling in a way that possibly we did not um, when we were younger. And therefore, we feel in the, in the school that it is important to have support for the children as far as, um, you know, psych psychological counsellors are concerned at every level, child psychologists are now. Yeah psychologists, sorry, are concerned. So at every age group, but the challenges are different. So rather than having one or two counselors who are more generic to the entire range of student experience, what we try to do is that for each section or each phase of the growing up journey, we have a counselor that focuses on children of that specific age group. For instance, in our infant school, we've got our counsellors for children from five to seven. Right. You know, in our junior school, it moves again a few grades higher. And by the time the children come to senior school, their, their challenges have changed, their vulnerabilities have changed, their, uh, their struggles, their bodies, their, their mental space, all of that has changed. And therefore, the counsellor is having a conversation that is very different from what it would have been with a child, you know, maybe in class three or even in class six. So I think the decision to have different counselors focusing on different um, stages of the trajectory is, mm -hmm. is a very good one. It has worked well. I think it has lent our children a lot of support. And as the children move from one section to the other, we have a very detailed handing over that, you know, the the psychologists of the first group hand over to the second group with every child giving background, giving context uh, so wow. that it's easier to take it further, you know? And uh, I think it's, I think it adds strength to us and to the kids. So lovely to see that you're actually walking the talk. I mean, people are talking about mental health everywhere, but very few are taking such solid steps to ensure that everyone is covered in the most uh, applicable way possible. Amazing. Yes. We are definitely trying to. So, <laughs> And we've got a great team. I think, uh, you know, I have tremendous mm -hmm. respect for my counsellors because I see the work they do and how fundamental it is to, to the sense of self that a child has, to the experience of growing up that a child has. So at every stage, uh, I've got a fabulous team. How nice. Uh, Ma'am, on the one hand, media, social media have helped us raise awareness about mental health issues, you know, especially amongst adolescents and teens. On the other hand, these same platforms seem to be aggravating the mental health crisis. What are your thoughts on this? 
um i am you know i am deeply deeply conflicted by this dr mm-hmm. pirol because i think social media has really the potential to be a monster and i think that that extremely ugly side of human beings that i don't know is triggered by what social media is increasingly becoming a space to allow uh the venting and the expression of that side of us mm-hmm. i see it uh, i see it a lot especially in the increase in the cases of cyber bullying mm-hmm. also in the kind of uh, you know just just body shaming or being mean to each other the kind of things that children are saying on these social platforms that's one part of it the other part is also the constant uh, you know the constant gaze right uh, i think that you know when i was growing up uh, who were the people who were really judging me maybe a handful of friends who were friends you know mm-hmm. who would um, who would say something and you would maybe feel bad for a day or two and then it would be fine because you're friends or it would be people i know or people i had a certain kind of equation and relationship with now these children are being judged by the entire world whether it's insta whether it is facebook whether it is you know snapchat or whatever it is that they are on um the number of likes they get impacts them there is this tremendous need to project uh the perfect life everything they do seems sometimes i tell my children that you know it's like your lives do not exist unless you document them somewhere uh but um, and they they sometimes with the more senior ones they'll say but miss this is also memory making mm-hmm. but i feel which they are right about it is memory making but it's also kind of moving away to a very digital kind of memory making and moving away from your own mind and memory and <laughs> experiencing of the moment so uh, why do you need social media to create a memory of a wonderful holiday what is it doing in your heart and in your head for you to carry for the rest of your life and why is that dependent on the number of pictures you take or the the constant number of pictures that you take rather right. you know and how other people respond to it so whether it's what they eat or what they wear or where they go i think there is a tremendous pressure to live up to certain standards of a good life uh that is very very external to them but mm-hmm. that impacts them greatly and i think it places a lot of pressure on them so for me for all the good that uh, social media has done i think it has done tremendous harm as well because um, you know it's it's just given space to a certain ugliness right. that did not exist earlier and i think as the guardian of the mental health and safety of so many children it impacts you more because you want to keep them safe you want to yes. watch them thrive yes. and here you know children are barely trying to survive correct it is uh, actually you know dr goel it is heartbreaking hmm. and yeah. i truly feel that uh, the mandate of what a good school is has changed over time it is no longer just about the academics today there are many schools and all of them are academically sound you know all of them have good teachers they have certain facilities they have resources yeah. uh, i would find it very difficult to say that this is a bad school for any school that i know of they're all good but the experience of a school is about more than the academic engagement Absolutely. it is about the experience that you weave around that it is about how a kid feels when they know they're going to go to school in the morning is it with anticipation or is it with apprehension and i feel that my biggest responsibility now is to create a space where they are happy i think they are dealing with more than enough and i don't want this to be one more thing for them to deal with you know that's that would be my mission actually to uh, for them to know that okay school is a place where they've got my back which is a home in so many ways which is a place that they're going to push me but um, they're going to push me because they think i can do better 
they are going to hold me to a certain standard and uh, are going to draw a lot of lines for me not to cross but they are also going to give me space for my voice and for me to be the best version of myself because they love me you know How nice so let's see that's the dream <laughs> absolutely so ma'am uh, coming to your uh, love for books i know you're an ardent reader and you've worked in the field of editing for so long you know in many ways i'm a reader too and i find a long drawn story in a massive book very meditative mm. the reader slowly mm. gets acquainted with the plot the characters reveal themselves eventually but yeah. nowadays the attention span is so low that children are not even finishing those 10 second reels anymore so how can we get them back to this you know this mindful living this life of intent which we were so used to um you know dr goel if you have an answer to that please do tell me <laughs> i wish i knew i wish i knew but i completely hear what you say because um, honestly that's it the attention span has become so so small and even when uh, like i see very often something they will just fast forward right until there is action yeah. you know the the building up to the action the the slow uh, wide angle photography in which <laughs> you are getting right. context you are getting you know the building up of suspense or whatever it is they have no patience for that uh, so they will fast forward until there is something happening and it's the same when they read hmm. a lot of them that you know they will if there is a long descriptive paragraph or page they will just skip until a point where they think that there is there is movement there is apparent movement right something is happening plot. someone yeah. is doing something yeah in a obvious way i always you know tell my students that when you're reading something is always happening even if they're describing just a scene and just the way that the weather is on a particular day it is still happening because it is helping your mind to create uh, a context right. so action is not only action action can things can unroll in different ways but for them the the understanding i think is uh, is has become limited and they are very very impatient with anything that is slow hmm. i i say that in metaphorical terms as well as literal they are impatient with anything that is slow uh, i see that i wish i could get them to figure out a way that makes them read we have a very very strong and vibrant reading program uh, which we kind of stress on and i think our kids do read we make it a point that they do and not as much as i as i would like them to especially as they start growing older mm-hmm. but um, they do i think we are trying to do the best we can dr gol but yes this is something that sometimes saddens me that the love for reading is uh, seems to be on the wane but then at the same time i see how much of new literature is being produced uh, how much of it is being consumed so maybe maybe there is all that bad there is hope and <laughs> there, is, there hope. is no need to despair as of now but uh, but yes i think attention spans have become less and when i say that you know uh, they they have no patience with anything slow i think sometimes even with themselves Mm. Uh, i hear you give themselves enough time to uh, become themselves they want everything to happen very quickly and therefore if they are taking time even if it is something as simple as understanding of a concept uh, sometimes i tell students if we are talking about an example that is appropriate that you know it'll come give it time you don't uh, no human being understands everything right away we all have our ideas of relative strength and relative improvement but so give yourselves time but i think they uh, they are very impatient with themselves so this is uh, this is one thing i keep telling my girls they're both teenagers and when they get impatient with something and they want to just do something to get it done i mm-hmm. tell them this is like a muddy lake the more mm-hmm. you pat down the sand the more uh-huh. it's going to rise just wait it will settle yeah. basic yeah. rules taught in school everything <laughs> will settle just wait and then they get perspective like okay we need to do nothing for a while yes. Like, yes, yes it's important yeah so, i really yeah. wish they would do a lot more of nothing i think uh, children <laughs> we today we need the poo to come in now a lot more <laughs> <Yes>. of nothing <laughs> 
<laughs> I would love my students to be doing a little more of nothing. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to love this podcast a lot more than I thought. <laughs> Ma'am, come yes, in. I can imagine, uh, you know, a lot of my teachers and possibly parents being aghast at that. So I think I should qualify that. Say it in moderation. In moderation. <laughs> but but yes, I think that they stretch themselves so thin sometimes that it starts exhausting them. True. So uh, moments of breathers, moments of that doing nothing and just being. I'd be very happy to see my kids, especially my senior kids, doing more of that. Right, ma'am. Uh, coming back to mental health now, yeah. teachers' mental health is just as important and at risk as the children studying under them. Correct. However, teachers tend to live up to the role that they've been placed in, and you know they usually suffer in silence. Do mm. you see this? I mean, how do you think your school or even other schools can step in and support the teachers who are working so hard for the kids? I think, uh, Dr. Gold, that's very, very, uh, very relevant, this point that you've raised. I think the teachers have a tremendous amount on their plate. Mm -hmm. And uh, as adults, they also have responsibilities, not just of school, but of home, uh, of their own lives. Um, and definitely the mental health of teachers needs to be addressed in more significant ways. We are in the stages of figuring out a program, at least some kind of helplines that we can enter into a, uh, you know, an understanding with where our teachers can just call if they need to vent, if they need advice, if they are feeling a certain way and just want to say things that they do not think they want to say to other people. Uh, we do have some of the teachers will sometimes go to the counselors in school, but you know, it's different with a colleague at the end of the day. Uh, possibly someone outside would be better. So we are, even as I, I'm speaking to you, we are in the process of setting that up for our teachers. How lovely is that? Yeah. But, um, and like I said, we don't need to know. Uh, I don't need to know who's calling, what they're talking about, entirely confidential, but um, they should know that they have this, you know, this option that if things right. are just becoming a lot, there is someone who any time night or day they can speak to. That's great. Really great. Uh, coming back to teachers, ma'am, I read a very interesting study and I've been waiting to discuss this particular study with you. Mm -hmm. Now, this study says that uh, children's happiness quotient can be the highest mm -hmm. if a child has the same class teacher moving up with them as they go through school. The mm -hmm. subject teachers, of course, can change according yeah. to the subject which comes in. I'm not mm -hmm. sure as a psychologist what I feel about it, but as an educationist, what are your thoughts? Mm. Okay, actually, I would be very interested to know what you feel about it, <laughs> to learn a little bit more. Uh, but um, see, I think one needs to, Dr. Goel, strike a balance. Mm. Uh, so what we have in our school, for instance, is until junior school, which is until class four, Okay. The, uh, the same teacher is teaching everything. All right. Okay. Um, so you have a class teacher and that class teacher does different things with you along with an associate teacher. And uh, there are different areas of strength that come in, for instance, when you're doing an assembly or you're playing, then obviously there are different teachers taking care of that. Hmm. But as you grow, then you have class teachers uh, and then the subject teachers come in and out. Right. I don't really think it has been working badly. But what we do do is that, um, for instance, I'll give you from senior school, the teacher in class eight stays with the class teacher, okay, yep. who's like the constant. She's the one who in the morning will take the attendance. So every class has a class teacher and an associate teacher, standard eight to 12, I'm talking about. Hmm. They will remain the same eighth, ninth, tenth. Oh, okay. okay. So the kids grow with them through those three years. Then there is a change in standard 11 who will go through with them till standard 12. Okay. Oh, so it's good both, I think, for the kids because there is a certain sense of stability. Right. Uh, and at the same time, you have a whole lot of subject teachers who are coming in in different uh, periods. So there is a good combination of the two. But that's the way we do it. And it's also good, I think, as far as the teachers are concerned, because they're on rotation. You mm -hmm. know, they teach standard eight, then nine, then 10. And then after that, back to standard eight. 
nine. Right. So you've basically implemented this study already in a small part. So yes, maybe not for ten did. years, but for three at least. Wonderful. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. Oh, I'm so glad I was able to discuss this with you then. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is something. Uh, but what is your opinion on this? I really would like to know. I am actually thinking a lot about this recently. I'm trying to get some inputs from other schools and colleges as well. I think it might help because there will be a certain sense of mentorship, a certain mm-hmm. sense of belonging, mm-hmm. but it will also take away from the students what a new class teacher might bring. Like you said, mm-hmm. after three or four years, yeah. I see students very influenced by different teachers in different ways. Mm-hmm. If we deprive them of this experience and influence that comes in with new teachers, mm-hmm. I'm not sure whether it's the best thing for them. But I also know how comfortable it can be to have the same mm-hmm. face, you know, as you go through school. Yeah. It might soften the blows of the outside world. Mm-hmm. So I am myself trying to find out how this will work, you know, especially in our Indian setting. But I am still mm-hmm. curious. I am still very intrigued by it. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. Whenever you do get some clarity, Doctor Gold, do share it with me. Definitely. <laughs> like <laughs> I told you, I think for us, this is this is a good combination of um, the the changing and the unchanging. Hmm. Uh, so, so let's see. I I think it works well for the kids so far. Great, ma'am. On a very personal note, has yes. there ever been an incident with a student which has really warmed your heart? You know, so much that all adversity just faded away, or any <laughs> moment that simply broke your heart and you didn't know what to do with it later. Oh wow, that's that's a tough one because um, this may sound like a cliche, Doctor Goel, but mm-hmm. actually there has been several of both. um i think uh, the former category when uh, when something a student does touches your heart is the reason i do this job i can and imagine it is what i i think any teacher would say this to you mm-hmm. that's what makes us come to school each day i every year on children's day i tell the children you are the reason i come i come to work every day but um, i think this would you know when a student who you have taught and who has gone into the world makes the effort and takes the time to reconnect to come and meet you for no reason other than just to want to meet you it is one of the most heartwarming things oh wow because you have absolutely nothing that you can do for them then they stand to gain nothing from you but um but i think that is one of the most rewarding that when they they call you on teachers day even if you've taught them you know 10 years back or 15 years right. back in some cases i'm sure or they invite you to the the weddings of their children mm-hmm. i uh, i remember you know some of my teachers mm-hmm. i think that's very very uh, it's quite irreplaceable that feeling True. quite irreplaceable so uh, the small things that my children do i think every time they um uh, increasingly again i will say because my interaction is much more with my senior children i think every time a student has trusted me with a vulnerability um mm. uh, i have been very humbled because the young people today do not trust you easily oh i agree I'm, and with things that matter enough to them that that would maybe make them cry or would make their voices quiver if they come and talk to me about those things i take it as a tremendous compliment and i find it incredibly incredibly uh, like i said humbling i take that uh, trust very very seriously but uh, at the same time it's it breaks your heart when you feel frustrated about not being able to do more to help them especially when you see children struggling with the home situation or, right um, you know it there is only so much one can do and it's so one feels so helpless that you cannot really do more sometimes uh, when i some of the kids some of the things that they've shared with me or told me you just feel like putting your arms around them and saying that you know you don't worry it'll be okay but um, that's that's not the solution uh, and they sometimes have to go back into dealing with whatever the situation is outside so it's very frustrating i think and heartbreaking in terms of that i find it absolutely absolutely uh, heartbreaking when children are forced to study things they don't want to 
Mm-hmm. And they are forced to choose paths and careers that they have absolutely no interest in uh, because their parents believe it is the best thing for them to do. Uh, I don't know if it is or it isn't. But the feeling that a person gets, you know, Dr. Goel, that I hate this. Oh, yeah. And I have to do it and I have to continue doing it. And there is nothing I can do about it. Uh, when I hear those conversations, it's very, very saddening. And again, it's linked to the sense of frustration because there's nothing you can do about it. At best, you can have a conversation with the parents concerned. Work sometimes, doesn't work at times. And uh, at the end of the day, yeah, it is the child of the parents. And parents in their own way, I think, always want what is best for their kids. So it's so complex, this entire dynamic. Too many but layers. Yes. But yes, it's it's tough. That bit is tough. Right. Also, ma'am, uh, taking away from this question, are there any blind spots that parents seem to have developed nowadays with respect to their child's mental health? I'm sure you see a lot of children with issues, but sometimes parents see it and sometimes parents don't. Any central issues which you see are being completely ignored? Um, I think generally, you know, even in conversations with other educators and other principals, um, one of the things that you'll hear, I'm sure if you speak to other people like me, is that uh, very often when it comes to learning disabilities, Hmm. we find a resistance in even getting testing done Um, because there is so much of, a taboo that is associated with it, which is so unfortunate because if you test and identify, you can uh, you can remediate. You know, you can mediate and bring in some kind of support for the child. But very often there is a resistance there. Um, I think sometimes if the kids are struggling, parents don't want to see it. Hmm. I also think sometimes parents have a they believe the kids are a little stronger than they are which is a paradox because sometimes they believe the kids are also weaker than they are. But I have seen examples of both, that the uh, putting the pressure of you always have to be strong, you always have to be on top of it, you always have to be able to handle everything, uh, when sometimes the kid is not able to and is putting up this constant facade I have seen that also. And I have also seen when uh, it is assumed that this child will not be able to do certain things, will not be able to handle, will not be able to manage, uh, will not be able to rise to uh, challenges that put a strain when the kid has it within him or her to do that. So I have seen those assumptions work both ways. But, um, yeah, I, I, I guess that's it. Wow, that's a lot of transference, I think, happening from parents to children. Yeah. But is it something that, uh, Dr. Goel, you see happening? Well, my my whole, let's say, sample, the mm. sample of students or parents that I work with is very limited because these are the ones who have identified that they need help. Ah, correct. Right? So then they come to me. Mm. And I don't work with very young children, so it's always mm-hmm. the young adults who yeah. come but they've already crossed that first barrier Correct. Correct. of you know, needing help. So that's why my sample is a little different. Mm-hmm. I but uh, yeah, when I speak, when I work with schools at a larger level, we mm-hmm. try to do this. You know, we try to talk mm-hmm. to the parents and tell them, look at them. Mm-hmm. Don't look at the mirror and then try to place them into that image that you see. Yeah, that's good. Just look at them. Yeah. I think, you know, as a school, uh, we have been very blessed in our, uh, in, in the kind of parents we have. So it's it it's this is definitely not something that I feel is across the board and every parent is like that. But even the cases that are few and far between, you know, it's it's a life, it's a child, it's it's an individual, right. and it matters even if it's it's not the norm. True. But uh, by and large, I think uh, parents, my interaction with them in the school has been reasonable. It's been rational. It's been. Uh, Extremely us being on the same page. How nice. That's very empowering. Truly. That's very empowering. That's very empowering. Great. Ma'am, so another really personal question coming your way. 
I'm sure you've seen a physical first aid box. We have one at home. You'll have one mm. in the school. You know, we keep our band aids, painkillers, antiseptic, anything for those minor cuts and bruises. Yeah. But sometimes we have bad emotional days, and we are just emotionally mm. bruised. We need mm. something to take care of us. What if you were to keep an emotional or a mental first aid box with you, mm-hmm. which you could open at any time, and it would make you feel happy? So, what would you put in it? Wow. what a what a lovely question though <laughs> it's it's a beautiful question and thank you so much how best to answer it i've had such uh, beautiful boxes come out of this question from all my guests that i'm always waiting to see what my next guest thinks yeah. of so um what would i put in a box that is to heal me or help mm. me heal when i'm having a rough day is that what it amounts to yes yes definitely a book right definitely a book uh, possibly poetry hmm uh some music okay i would even uh, even though it sounds horrible i might even throw in the phone because it will allow me to speak to uh to a friend okay so the conversation i would put into that box right. access to the people uh matter to me okay and uh, maybe a good cup of coffee oh wow <laughs> so i think <laughs> this box sounds uh, that should help me uh, dust myself off and stand up again uh, and take on whatever is headed my way but yes usually conversations with the people i love uh some alone time uh poetry a book music and a good cup of coffee how beautiful thank you so much for sharing such an intimate part of yourself with us today because all of us have a different box you know everybody yeah. puts in some part of their selves into this box and i i really hope you make one some day yeah, and you have it handy when you need it thank you for saying that may i ask dr gold what you would oh wow <laughs> so my box actually is very dynamic you know depending on the month or maybe the part of the year i sometimes change things in my box mm. i'm a reader as well but i love writing more so i always always have an empty diary and a pen aha uh-huh. i like to yeah. keep a piece of dark chocolate because that's something i usually need when i'm down okay i also keep uh, qr codes of my favorite songs sometimes <laughs> conversations with people now i'm fortunate enough to record them ah. so i have some of those Mm. and this keeps changing you know sometimes so I, when i asked my younger one what she would put she was very practical and said mama i would put a wad of cash also because sometimes you need retail therapy i said okay well that makes so much sense actually yes. Yes. yes and she said mama you want an instant pick me up so that's what i would also add so that's how our box evolved you know we do one together so my daughters and me will put it all together and ah. we open it together so yes. that's what we do that sounds good and that sounds very very effective Yes, so true. <laughs> well you know as usually uh, when i come to an end of a discussion with a guest on my podcast i leave the floor open if there is a question that you want to ask me as a psychologist although you have asked me a couple of questions already but if there is anything very specific that you want to ask me as a psychologist this is your time go ahead wow so i think uh, the two questions over the course of the conversation dr goel that i did ask you i really did um I was interested in your answers number 1 about you know the teachers right and changing teachers uh then also about reading hmm those are both things that I I would like to know what you thought about um your box what a beautiful beautiful idea and it's great to know what's in your box <laughs> so <laughs> but um I think so, if, if I would um, ask you I'd like to know what in your experience is the biggest challenge that kids face today if there was one thing that you would say kind of trumps all others um what would it be as an adult who wants to take care of kids and make it better for them what are the things that you would guide me towards again um, i would talk from my experience about the older kids mm. because i work with very young ones yeah. what i see in pre teens or in teens nowadays is this strife and this whole uh, eagerness to be relevant mm. and they feel that the minute they stop being relevant they stop existing it's like this whole philosophical thought we had you know when we were studying mm. in college we were taught 
that if a tree fell in the middle of a forest yeah. but nobody heard it fall did it actually yeah. fall yeah. so right. they are grappling with these questions now in a very non metaphysical way hmm. they're seeing it all the time if you attended a party but no picture was taken did the party ever happen happen or if you are not doing enough to be visible do hmm. you even matter anymore yeah now these things have become issues without even being labeled as such mm. it's something that they deal with on a daily basis because the minute you're off the grid you're actually off the grid Good. and you don't know what's happening conversations are changing slang is changing mm. i have noticed some uh, of you know my younger patients coming and tell me that we were not on instagram because we had exams for a month and when mm. we came back we realized that the language had changed wow and it's like oh really it's that fast Mm. but that's how they talk even when mm. they talk to each other mm. it's very influenced by what's going on in the cyber world so i think they're mm. really really grappling with this relevance and this keeping up mm. with the fast changing and the future for them is not just unknown it's unknowable mm. they have no idea what's coming their way yeah so i think just building resilience is basically the only knowledge that they really really need and mm. schools like yours and some other beautiful schools are doing a great job Let's just hope that they realize that going slow, going underwater, and just hiding is fine. Hibernation is beautiful. Estivation is even better in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, we all need to do it once in a while. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. Couldn't agree more with you, ma'am. Uh, this has genuinely, genuinely been one of the most fascinating conversations I've had on my season so far because. I have wanted to ask so many questions. This podcast gave me the chance to ask you these questions directly. Your answers affect not just one or two children; it affects the whole generation. So I'm so glad that you were able to take the time off to come and discuss these things with us. I'm sure as parents and children who are listening to the podcast now, they will have probably some answers, probably some more questions. But at least the conversation has started. You know, people are thinking in the right direction thanks to the time that you have given us. So a lot of gratitude from me, a lot of gratitude from my listeners. Thank you for doing this, and thank you for being on Detangle today. Not at all, Dr. Goel. Thank you for inviting me. Like I said, it has been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed speaking with you and also listening to what you had to say. I consider, you know, where I am to be quite a tremendous privilege and an honor. And I'm actually uh, pretty much in awe of my students because I think they are just fabulous. And um, to be around them, to I'm constantly learning from them you know you just gave me this example of how fast things are changing in their world so one has to learn from them if one has to uh, create a space that is relevant for them absolutely And, um, therefore it's 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 been great fun and it's been a joy speaking with you thank you very much thank you so much ma'am 